brawl. Or just do a full regex. Yeah, exactly. Like, like, just make it regex. Like regex, 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 you know. Default if to regex, write, please. Like, yeah. If you can't yeah. write regex, you, you need to go fix that. up y'all before we hop into this episode i just wanted to remind you that we launched the critical thinking discord community a couple weeks back and ever since we did it's been a pretty much a constant stream of hacking stories exploitation techniques cool research tool devs in there talking about features and taking feature requests um so it, it's been a really great community i've personally learned a lot already uh, and i think you will too so definitely check that out if you haven't already it's at ctbb dot show slash discord. Um, and for those of you that are interested in supporting the podcast, you can become a subscriber on discord. Uh, there's a 25, $10 and $5, uh, subscription, which gives you access to various benefits ranging from private scripts and, uh, unredacted bug reports and, uh, what else? Master classes uh, that that would be at the critical thinker tier, the top tier, all the way down to a supporter badge at the lowest tier. Um, so if you're interested in supporting the pod, that's the best way to do it. All right. With that, ctbb.show slash discord. I'll see you there. Enjoy the episode. Yo, what's up, dude? Yo, yo. How's it going? Good. Just got done with my uh, nice little pre-podcast little bounce, little warm up. Ready yeah, to... You, know, you seem to always forget that you're three hours ahead of me. Yeah, yeah, it's like 7.15 in the morning for you right now. Yeah, yeah, something like that. <laughs> Rip. Well, thanks for getting up early to record the pod. Um, I wanted to start today off with a little bug bounty struggle story, you okay. know? Because I feel like a lot of the people that listen to this pod, you know, I, I hear a lot of, or at least what we see on the Discord often is, you know, people saying, there's a lot of struggles to bug bounty and that and that's true but it seems like you know everyone's just sort of at the top winning 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 you know posting there i just got awarded whatever bounty on whatever on twitter right yep. but i wanted to flip it around a little bit today and give you guys a little bit of an insight into the actual hacking struggles um so <clears throat> this this goes back to i guess the past two live hacking events that i've been a part of the one in tokyo and the one in, in Portugal. And um, so I just barely scraped into the top 10 in in uh, Tokyo, which is great. That was my goal. Um, but I think I placed like fourth or fifth in, in Portugal. But both of those events, for me, were like a little bit subpar as far as yeah. like bounties go right as far as like actual earnings go and, and yeah. even though you know i was ranking pretty well on them it was a little bit a little bit rough and so and and around this time you know i'm traveling all around japan i'm traveling all around portugal and i get back to my home and i'm like man i feel so disconnected from the hacking you know yeah. like i haven't had like a normal schedule where i've deep dived something in a long time um and i just feel like that start you know that difficulty getting restarted again do you know what i'm talking about i mean you're, you're pretty like i feel like you do hunting in spurts right do, do you also feel that sort of like stress when you haven't been hacking in a while and you have to restart yeah i mean i feel that a lot like i don't hack nearly as much as you do um and so like that is kind of like an all the time struggle for me where like if i have stopped hacking for a while and i need to get back into it it's very difficult mm -hmm. for me to like get that ball rolling again usually i either need um somebody who i'm like hacking with who like has the energy going already like you're usually a good source of that um mm -hmm. or i'll have to like just you know kind of like anything else that's really difficult you just have to like start on it like how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time so it's the same thing with like yeah. any other hard task that's like difficult to start you just have to start it and eventually like you'll get into it and usually like especially because it's something that we enjoy like we'll fall into flow state or something but um you really just have yeah. to start and that that's always like the hardest thing is just like starting and, with no that, sort of like, you know. Yeah, exactly. And th that's, that's kind of where I was at this time, man. And uh, like this one actually really was hard for me to push through. Like normally it's not very hard for me to push through and normally I'll just be like, you know, 
all right, time to just get back at it. But this time I was like, man, I just, I don't know what target to go after. I don't know what, like, I was just kind of lost, you know? Um, yeah. But just like you said, you know, you just kind of, you pick a target and you, and you deep dive it. And then here's the thing, man, here's the thing that was crazy. I went four days, which is like not super irregular for me, but I was feeling it a little, you know, I was feeling the pressure a little bit. I went four days without finding a bug, right? Okay. Zero bugs for four days. And that like, you know, when you're already feeling down in the dumps and you're like, you're already feeling that the, that the it, ambition is not there, that the motivation is not there. That just, you know, it's like, mm, like a knife in the chest and twisted, yeah. you know? I will say this is um, like normal for me because like oftentimes when I look at programs, <laughs> I'll be looking at like a lot of times mobile stuff and yeah. for lots of programs, there's not mobile bugs. Like it's just like either a very small app or it's just like, you know small tax surface whatever and like i'll spend like a day like a whole day just like digging looking at all the different things like tr falling paths down rabbit holes that don't lead anywhere and then just like by the end of it i'm like okay well <laughs> i know, I know a little it. bit more than i did earlier but that's about it yeah and 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 but you know that's that's the way you got to start right yeah. like that's the way you got to get into it because yeah it and I, I don't know. So like after those four days, I was like, man, I feel like shit, but it's Friday and I'm going to give it because this is a full hacking week. Like I did, you know, nine to five, um, you know, for this week, trying to get back into the schedule of things and stuff like yep. that. And then on the last day, I popped like three bugs and a crit, you know, <laughs> that paid nice. out right before this call. So I'm very, nice. very hyped nice. about that. That's awesome. Um, uh, but you know, that it, it takes a little while to get back into your groove. And that's one of the things that I, that I see people that are beginners. I mean, it, it, I mean, obviously even pros struggle with it, right. You know, cause we're having this conversation right now, but, um, this is one of the things I see almost all hackers struggle with actually is, is this whole concept of like, okay, how much time do I devote into this? How do I get restarted when I'm not, you know, already in the zone? How do I get back in that flow state? Yeah. And dude, I mean, it's, I would, I, I'm going to like come back and listen to this next time I'm in this same situation so I can give myself a little pep talk, just start and just start doing it and start hacking and start gaining expertise on an application and do the, the volumes will come. So now I'm yeah. back, I'm back on my groove. Awesome. And, and I think one of the things I, I think for me, um, one of the pros that I haven't really talked about much on the podcast about being a full-time bug bounty hunter is that you actually don't have to deal with this very often. Because you you know you often have a pipeline of bugs. Yep. You're hacking on a really regular basis, and it, you know unless you're taking massive amounts of time off, you very rarely have to like redo that whole process again. So that, that that's that's something I'm really grateful for. Yeah, I was gonna say like notes are also like one of the biggest things that you can use to help yourself mm -hmm. because oftentimes if you think about it, like when you're hacking nine to five, um, like every day a week or every day of the week you know, you come back, you know what yeah. you were doing yesterday. Um, like you, it's fresh in your mind, you know, at most it's maybe 10 mm -hmm. hours, 12 hours old. And yeah. you know, yeah. if you come back to that, you, you know what you were working on, but if you go away for like a week, a lot of times like your memory then gets filled with other things that you were doing. Like you kind of start to forget about the like recency of the specifics of the details of things that you were looking into. So if you take notes of those things, like everything that you're working on, like all the things that you were looking down, all the things that you like wanted to still investigate, and then you come back to it like that can help offset that um, that like delay of like not knowing mm. where to start and what things to look at because you have a list of things that you know you were already looking at and you can sort of kickstart that. The other thing is um, like you just have to remember that anytime you start a new program, it's always going to be like this. So we yeah. have the same yeah. problem when we start like any new program. There's always that discovery period in the beginning and it just takes time to like get familiar with the program, like spend time sussing it out, understanding the ins and outs. If you've taking time off and switch programs, then like that's, you know, double whammy, right? So it, you have no context on this mm. new program. You still have to do discovery phase and you're trying to kickstart yourself with no notes, no starting point, no nothing. Like, yeah, it's definitely going to be a little bit of a slow roll. But once you can get there, you know, take notes on everything that's like looks interesting. So that way, when you come back, like even if you take two days off, you can come back again. You have notes, stuff to look at. Yeah, no, that that's that's a great insight, dude. And I actually, it's funny you mentioned that without even knowing it, because I actually had been tuning up, you know, my notes game, because we we talk about it on the pod a, a decent bit, and we've seen an overwhelming representation of the the no notes sort of people, right? Yeah. Um, but so ever since that happened, I was like, man, there's got to be people that take notes on a you know on a pretty regular basis. So I've been I've been finding them, and I'm gonna have them on the pod. 
Yeah. Um, and we're going to be able to interview them about their, their note-taking things. But um, one of the things that I've noticed that's pretty consistent um, uh, across the note-takers is they are very consistent top performers on one program. Right, you don't see a lot of people that switch programs on a regular basis taking very detailed notes. But the people that do take notes, they stick to one program and they absolutely crush it. And they know the insides and outs of that program, like they are the person for that program, right? Um, yeah. So that was really inspiring to me. And and I started to. So I'm going to look at my notes right here. I've got a section that says almost vulns slash gadgets. Okay, that, those are the things that are sort of like. Um, uh, you know, almost there that maybe I might be able to use in a chain. I've got app segments, which is actually like on the target that I'm I'm talking about. It's one big domain, but there's lots of different like sub apps at, mm. at, under different paths, right? That have different JS files are clearly different, you know, um, mm -hmm. segments of the app. And knowing about each one of those, you know, you can try to chain together pieces from all the different ones to, to build gadgets. Yeah. And then I've just kind of got interesting functionality and notes on the actual deep dive and then specific target, specific notes. Um, yeah. Well, and, and I can and tell so, that you've already I don't know. Like, it, we're getting done there. some of that discovery phase too, because those things that you mentioned, even even just like this, that, that sub app concept, it shows that like, yeah, you spent time looking at this, you realized that there was some sort of a pattern here and eventually, like you sort of cracked it in a sense that makes sense, at least for now. Like a lot of a lot of the time, like while we're doing this stuff, I think it's kind of like running theories where like you don't really know 100 percent what's going on. But like you can take a pretty good guess based mm. on the behavior that you see. And so a lot of times it's good to make those sort of assumptions where you say, OK, I'm pretty sure this is how this is working. I'm going to run with this theory until I mm -hmm. run into some data that, you know, contradicts my my theory. And then I can rework my theory if I need to. And that can mm. let you, you know, find vulnerabilities because if you if you have a good idea of how it's working in the back end or like what it's actually doing, then you can, you know, make more educated guesses towards the type of bugs that you're targeting or the types of techniques that you're trying. Um, mm. And mm. so I, I, I like that sort of like running theory type stuff where basically you have, you know, oh, there's sub apps here. OK, you know, I'm going to run with that theory until I see something that contradicts it. Or maybe there's like two different systems here and that leads you down. And it also helps you like identify like anomalies within those patterns. So that if something does contradict your theory, you're like, huh, that's weird. Like, why? What is that? Like, why does that behave differently? Yeah, no, 100 percent. And the same sort of thing, you know, Franz was talking about on the episode, um, you know, with him about about mapping out what's going to be happening in your head. And I think taking notes on that is uh, is a really big um yeah, it's a really big benefit. And and actually, so taking the notes thing a little bit further, um, I, I need to get a couple of these people on. But one of the things that I've, I've noticed in particular that people um, who really crush it on one program have been taking notes on is um, OAuth stuff, um, you know. Uh, enumerating different client IDs, uh, enumerating different scopes associated with different, um, you know, apps, uh, trying to uh, get client secrets, that sort of thing, right? Um, yeah. And and very, very cool because using those things, we can start to really map out and really understand at a deep level. And man, do they understand it at a deep level how the permissioning works for a given app. And so I just started d d diving that a little bit deeper and I already found a crit like less than a week in um, yeah. with it. Uh, and and as I'm as we're recording this episode, I'm seeing notifications pop on my phone like, okay, yep, we're dealing with it. We're dealing with it now. Um, so that's, that's, that's always good to see. Um, and so, yeah, especially auth-based notes, I think really, really important. Yeah, I mean, auth stuff is always like really weird. Um, because the more complex that an organization is, oftentimes there's multiple spots where you'll log in. And uh, yeah. the, the behaviors of those auth systems, either they have to be centralized, which means that they have some sort of like OAuth mechanism or like a centralized auth mm, system, mm, mm. or they're implemented separately, which means that there needs to be consistency across multiple impl implementations. And so in both cases, there's rooms for error and there's rooms for, for holes and stuff. So I, we mm. actually have some, some running notes in a, in a separate document. So I think we'll, uh, yeah. we're going to have an OAuth episode soon. I don't know if it'll be today, though. I don't think it's today. Yeah, I, it, it's on the episode for today, dude. We have so much stuff to cover and we're already, you know, as far in as we have. and We haven't even covered the first <laughs> bullet point. So, um, yeah, no, the, we'll definitely have an episode on that. I feel like I need to deep dive it a little bit more before we get the episode on it, though. But I will say, Joel, I don't know if you went back and listened to the SAML episode that I, I, I released last week. Um, I know you've been all over the place. I think you're recording in a hotel right now. But, <laughs> um, yeah, that 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 sort of thing, um, you know. It will also apply a lot, a lot to the uh, OAuth and, and OpenID stuff. Um, so definitely going to excited to keep deep diving that.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. <clears throat> Dude, we launched the Discord, man. We it, did launch it, the Discord. It's, it's out there. It's what, are, what are your thoughts? It's been really yeah. crazy. Um, we're up to almost a thousand members now. <laughs> I just checked this morning. It's like, yeah. you know, almost a thousand. Um, and uh, yeah, it's really awesome to see just like all the people coming in, having conversations like every day. There's just hacking conversations, just random things, um, people posting research and tools and, hey, I found this thing. Hey, anybody got an idea about this? It, it's it's really awesome to see um, the community like, you know, communicating and working on bugs together and, and just like, you know, enjoying this this space. So yeah, already just one weekend, yeah. it's really am an amazing, or two weeks in? One week, 100%. two weeks in. Yeah. yeah, I was I, I was so so excited and uh, encouraged by how much of a response we've had from the community and how active all the channels are, um, and yeah, and also just big shout out to anyone who got in on the the um, subscriptions, the Discord subscription memberships early on. Um, that is like so exciting for us to see, yeah. and uh, very exciting for our wallets as well because we've been running <laughs> critical thinking at like what like. Five hundred, six hundred dollar burn rate per month, ever <laughs> since the beginning, pretty much. Yeah. So, um, getting some some income to offset that is really really helpful. For, so, for those of you that want to support the pod, definitely go check out the Discord subs, um, and we're dropping a bunch of really cool stuff in the uh, exclusive subscribers channel, uh, mostly yeah. in the in the uh, the critical thinkers critical thinkers channel um yeah, definitely so like it's not just like for supporting the pod like obviously we appreciate yeah. the support but it's also for you guys um you know it's really for sharing exclusive yeah. information and stuff we posted a bunch of different um exclusive techniques and tips and links and tools and all sorts of things in the mm -hmm. in the critical thinkers chat um we're working on setting up our first master class you got mm -hmm. some ama questions coming in so yeah there's a lot of really awesome awesome things that are available in those in the paid tiers that are more exclusive benefits um but just in general like there's tons of people who just come in chat in the general chat hacking the yeah. chat in the hacking chat it's really it's really awesome yeah i mean we've definitely had some more i think the discussions that happen in the the supporter chats you know they're they're uh, a lot of them are tailored to specific vulnerabilities and and stuff you want to keep in the you know more exclusive <laughs> channels but there's been a lot of great um, high quality stuff like you mentioned in the general and hacking channels as well and uh, so I just grabbed a couple of the things that I wanted to kind of just give you guys a taste of what we're seeing in the discord um, the first thing was we're seeing a lot of conversation and really helpful conversation actually surrounding JS monitoring um, and and I'm a little, I'm not gonna lie, Joel, I'm a little like, I'm a little sad actually to see so <laughs> many people do this because like, I feel like, you know, content creation in the bug bounty realm is a little bit tricky uh, because it's like, okay, you know, do what do I share and how much do I share, right? And then when I share, how much competition am I creating for myself, right? And I will say, I have noticed an increase in dupes since we started oh, yeah. doing critical thinking. I, ha I really have. That's interesting. Um, and and stuff that you wouldn't really think is a dupe either, and, and and you know it could just be my my you know bias or whatever, but um, uh, you know I guess it, it, it there when there are people actually taking the advice, <laughs> it, it's it's a little bit you know and and people talking about it in the chat like oh you know I set up this script, um you know I'm I'm monitoring this endpoint and I already found these bugs I'm like. All right. Well, there goes yeah. one of my, you know, so it's, it's top. true because like literally just the other day, somebody in the in the critical thinkers chat, they pinged us and they were like, yeah, you know, like I was, I was stuck on this bug. And like then I was listening to the episode and you guys mentioned this thing and I tried it and yeah. it worked. And like, you know, I wouldn't have even thought about that. I was like, oh, yeah. man, like, uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, and it's great. It's great to see, but also, you know, it, it, it does, it's that, it's that dichotomy, you know, it's that, it's that battle uh, that you have as a content creator in Buck Bounty. But needless to say, we're glad to see it. We're going to keep them coming for y'all um, because, you know, when the community continues to perform, Buck Bounty industry continues to perform and, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. Is that it? Is that, that, is, the, that is the saying. Yeah, that yeah. is the expression, man. I got it. Uh, um, w w there's a mental. There's a whole like psych psychology thing behind this between like um, yeah. Uh, there's like two mentalities where it's like finite mentality and like mm. I don't know what the other one is, but it's basically like what, is it infinite, one piece? infinite game mentality? Is that yeah? The it's basically Simon like if Senec you think thing? of it all yeah. as one pie, it when somebody yeah. gets added, is it does everybody get a smaller slice of the pie or does the pie increase? Um, mm. And like usually, like people individually like have like a sort of a set like view on this um 
about like how they think about things just in general. And it's like yeah. the same thing with bug bounty where it's like, you know, if I share data, like, am I taking away from my bounties or am I just like increasing the overall research and then everybody gets more bounties, et cetera. Yeah. And to be, and to be honest, man, everyone's got such a unique perspective when it comes to what kind of bugs they're going to find as well. It's very unlikely yeah. that, that I am actually causing dupes for myself, but <laughs> I, I will, know. <laughs> you know, I, I think we mentioned the one time when, when we had Alex Chapman on the pod, there was one, one occasion when, uh, a blog that Alex wrote really helped me in exploiting a bug that he duped on. <laughs> That's uh, true. And, and I, that just, uh, in that moment, I was like, man, I feel for you, brother. <laughs> That's so, so funny. Yeah. Um, the things I wanted to shout out in particular were a couple of the people on the Discord. Um, XNL Hacker, who you guys probably know, we've shouted him out lots um, for the tools he's making, is, um, is using a modified version of a tool called JSMon. Um, yeah. which is a, uh, I mean, exactly what it sounds like, a sort of job tip change monitor for bug bounty. Um, we got another person in there, uh, Abby, who is using a custom script uh, and using the Scrappy uh, Python library to reach out and do the JavaScript monitoring, which is actually very close to what I do. And he writes a custom script for each individual um, uh, company that he's monitoring, you know, tailored to that company's JS files and, you know, running regexes that will produce results on that company's JS files. And then um, there's a couple other people. I don't, I'm not even going to try to pronounce E. <laughs> uh, Timus. And then Static Flow as well is also might be building something for the people. I don't know. I don't know if Static Flow is ready know. to, uh, you know, announce that yet, but we've been having some uh, exciting chats on a secret channel in the Discord. So, uh, Tanner, whenever you're ready to drop that thing, man, you know the world might be ready for it. So, yeah, absolutely. No, we've been um, we've been working behind the scenes with Tanner on uh, Static Flow, on some uh, some cool stuff. So we're hoping again more some exclusive stuff. So if you're interested, you know, go check out the Discord. But um, mm. yeah, we're we're hoping to have some ex more exclusive critical thinking tooling and uh, all sorts of fun things coming out very soon yeah dude this the the swag game should be fun too coming up we're we're working on that i don't know what the timeline like is that yes. gonna be because Unknown i was timeline. like i was yeah i was talking to our our person who's kind of helping with that and i was like hey you know you think we could roll this out by christmas and they're like <laughs> <laughs> no it's like late november it's like yeah can we do this yeah, in a month like, during the busiest season not a chance <laughs> so yeah no that makes sense um yeah okay so Obviously, uh, just a couple, couple more things I mentioned in the Discord was uh, secondary context bugs, which we've talked about on the pod a, a decent bit. I'll mostly skip over this now, but I, I am glad to see people saying, hey, I'm actually finding secondary context bugs out here that have yeah. high impact. Um, yeah. and, and actually, I know of a couple people that haven't even posted in the Discord publicly, but have DM'd me privately saying, hey, found some cool secondary context bugs and scored massive massive bounties from it yeah um, secondary context bugs are, are really really interesting we talked about it a bunch so if you're interested you can yeah. check out um a good example sam curry's uh starbucks uh blog yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sam curry and rhino reader featuring and, oh, rhino yeah. reader yeah oh that guy who's that Goodness, joel <laughs> what the heck man <laughs> I mean, it's not Sam Curry done that. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> it's dude. Well, it's Sam Curry shit. You know, it, it really is. There's there's a specific brand of stuff, and that's Sam Curry shit right there. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> sorry, I need to get some water. But the uh, the last thing was like, there's been some really good automationist. Automationist. You know, the, the, yeah, this is a new uh, term. Automationist that we come up with. shit. Mm, yeah, in um in the Discord, we've talked a good bit about um DNS wildcard filter and i'll just kind of give the tldr of that here um a lot of people have a lot of different approaches some tools do it automatically i think dnsx does some stuff um but really it's kind of a hard problem to nail down and one of the approaches that seems to have worked best for me and i've kind of discussed a little bit with the community is this concept of wildcard profiles and um what you'll do is when you when you detect a wild card um when you're doing subdomain enumeration um, you you will take that wild card and put it through a process to create a profile for what this specific wild card looks like. So you're generating multiple um, iterations, you're resolving it multiple times, you're querying different resolvers, you're adding and prepending things, you know, trying to figure out exactly where the uh, wild card break is. 
um, in the in the uh, definition, uh, you know, wh where it is at uh, in the subdomain structure, that sort of thing. And then you're also resolving it multiple times with multiple resolvers to try to get um, an idea of what IPs are being round robin returned in that in that, and then creating a, a profile of sorts uh, for what that wildcard should look like. And then when you resolve things which match that wildcard um, in the subdomain level, but do not match that response, then you know you've got a diamond in the rough, something that most peop other people won't find because they're just gonna be saying, all right, everything under dot whatever is, is, a, is a wild card. Um, and I'm just going to ignore it, but this one isn't. And so yeah. um, there's a lot of really good scope living in those sort of uh, in those sort of caveats uh, if you can read between the lines for the DNS. Yeah, for sure. And um, an interesting thing about wildcards. So I'm pretty sure this is like all the time. Um, but basically, like the way that you configure mm. a wildcard on DNS is that your your A record essentially the 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 record itself is is an asterisk. It's a star. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so you can. You can do a lookup on that. If you think something's a wild card and you want to verify, you can actually just dig star dot whatever dot com. No, you cannot. Yes, you can. Yep. And it no. it'll actually Yeah, yeah, totally. What yeah, the frick, Joel? Yeah. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. No. Hold on. Hold hold on. Put in quotes. I I gotta I gotta. What? Well, I mean, okay, I guess that sort of makes sense because it, anything there, I mean, what can I do, a slash there? Like, oh yeah, okay, but any character is gonna return that though, right? Right, but typically like a DNS, like because that's the way that it's being configured, like yes, the wildcard is probably wildcarding itself maybe, but yeah. um, that's also a really easy way that you can concretely check. Um, interesting, sure interesting. I wonder a if... Card. I wonder if some authoritative name servers will actually result like give you more information uh, if you actually hit star dot whatever dot dot com rather yeah. than you know bloody blah, blah dot whatever dot com. That's right. that's very interesting. I, I didn't it's know. It's super that. interesting behavior. Um, yeah, because like I can I have some wild cards configured on my own domain, and I do mm. it's it's configured like that. Like you do an asterisk dot whatever, yeah. and you can you know look it up. And I'm not sure if it's that the wild card is wild carding itself or if that's it could just be. that, it, that you know, it's wild carding everything else and it's giving you the literal lookup. But um, either way, like that's a really good way that you can get basically the wild card response and then you can use that to filter it. So if, if you're not sure that something's a wild card, you can literally just start out. And, yeah. Very nice, dude. I didn't know that. That's definitely something to, to keep in, in mind. And, you know, we've been kind of scheming with some of the guys in there with Golden and them. Um, you know about how exactly to get this stuff to work, and you have to put together so many different um, different pieces of the puzzle um, uh, when when trying to do this effectively. Uh, and we've even seen some experts hop in there, like uh, like Sean uh, Sy will yeah, will hop in there. Acid Note. Um, yeah, yeah, from Acid Note and and give some some good stuff. So I really appreciate um, the guests also being active in the in the discord that's uh that's really encouraging to see yeah it was hilarious on the first day he, he, he was like what's happening i just woke up and my phone is exploding i have like a million <laughs> notifications from this yeah. discord I, yeah just sleep. there was 15 people in here i woke up there's 500 people in here <laughs> yeah dude we we um we probably should have let them know but we, we had all the guests join the discord in advance because we were using it for like logistic stuff with planning and that sort of thing um and then, you know, we didn't really tell anyone we were going to launch it. And then all of a sudden, ding, 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 ding. You know, like the, the welcome, you know, channel is like blowing up. Um, so if you're listening, sorry about that, Sean. I hope you, hope you get some sleep. Sorry for anyone on the, uh, you know, Asia time zone when we launched that. Uh, but yeah. yeah. Um, cool. There was, a, there was another tool that I saw posted in there. Um, mm. It's called Thank You Next. Um, mm. Yeah. And, and this, is, uh, this seems specifically for Next.js. So I, I believe Next.js is mostly used for Web3 applications, um, mm, but it mm. might be used for other things. But um, it, it's called Thank You Next, letter U, uh, like Next, Thank You Next.js. Uh, uh, basically, yeah, yeah. all it does is it just parses, it looks for a Next.js build manifest, and then it will parse out all of the, uh, all of the routes that are available through that, uh, through the Next.js build manifest, and it'll just print them out for you. Super easy. Um, so if you're looking at Next.js applications, you see it's using Next.js. You can just run it through this tool. It'll give you all the routes. Um, super easy, nice, cool piece of research. Dude, I love this. 
I really, I love this a lot. And actually, this is something very um, sort of related to something that I wanted to talk about on the pod today, which was this this concept of client side paths. And and when we think about JS, um, when we think about JS file uh, recon, you know, reading the JS files, trying to extract the endpoints, that sort of thing, we kind of think about this like you know, grit your teeth process of staring at the JS and like till your eyes bleed and like trying yeah. to trace back all these functions to like, um, you know, get the correct parameters for a request that's going to be sent to the server side API. But in reality, something that I've been sleeping on is this whole concept of looking at how the client side routing actually works because like nine times out of 10, the applications that you're dealing with nowadays are going to all return the same you know, you're going to hit slash blah, blah, and it's still going to return the same response. And then the JS on the client side, you know, Angular, React, Next.js or whatever, is going to look at the path and show you a page based off of that, right? Right, um, right. And so looking at these, these client side paths as well within the JS files is massively helpful yeah. <laughs> because not only can you trigger, you know, various functions that are bound to these routes, um, uh, and maybe even get XSS. I've popped several XSS over the past week because of this trick. Um, uh, but you can also um, not have to like go through this terrible process of trying to figure out like you know what parameters go where in a request, and actually just have that the app generated for you by forcing a specific state in the application yeah. by navigating to that route. And I yeah. just I don't know why I haven't been doing this more often. And it, it's just it's a great trick. Well, and another thing that I've noticed is that, um, especially with Webpack stuff, so a lot of times you'll still have the Webpack uh, map files, and you can unmap it. You can view it in your browser, um, or yeah. you can unmap it locally. And oftentimes what you'll see is that the pages, there, there's usually a folder called like pages, and it has mm -hmm. like the the JSX or whatever. Uh, uh, is that the right terminology? The like uh, JS like templating thing? No, uh, no, no. Like, like the .ts .tsx files, TSX. like yeah, the yeah, TypeScript, TSX. and then yeah, yeah, JSX. Exactly. I think probably for just straight JavaScript stuff. Yeah. Right. Right. So basically, those like HTML esque JavaScript templating type mm -hmm. of stuff that's used in React typically. Yeah. Um, and you'll see that it'll only return like one page, and a lot of the time that's because it's using either um, uh, lazy loaded JavaScript or because mm -hmm. it's explicitly like checking whether or not it should load other parts of the app, even though it's in the code, and you just have to do a little bit more digging and, and the page like IDs and stuff are in there. So just like what you're talking about, where essentially like all this stuff is on the client side already. Like the, the front end pages, like there might be back end API endpoints that it's hitting, and those will also be in the JavaScript, but really the available pages for you to browse are all within that file right there. And so you can look through and you can find them and you can pull them out. And then usually you can also go one step further and you can either get the lazy loaded file for that page or you can find maybe there's a specific JS file just loaded on that page and that has extra functions, extra HGI, extra API endpoints, all that kind of, you know, juicy, juicy info. And yeah. uh, a lot of times yeah. at first glance, you wouldn't really see it because you might see the pages folder and see like, you know, two things in there and not, nothing's there that you haven't already seen. But if you, you know, go just one, one step further. It, yeah, hundred percent. And 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 I think JS Weasel is doing a lot of this stuff, right? Like doing the lazy loading, you know, unpack. And it's an expensive tool, but I have seen a couple people give testimonials recently saying, like, hey, this is really worth it, finding a lot more bugs with this. Yeah. And I like it. And I and I, I it's on my to-do list for this week to go um and try it again and work on it a little bit and you know, see if I can integrate it into my workflow a little bit more effectively. Yeah. One problem with that is it doesn't have Kaido integration and Kaido is my main tool that I'm using now for proxying. I switched over a couple of weeks back and I've put nice. probably 80 to 120 hours in Kaido over the past Dude, three or four I weeks. Say, I love yeah. everything about Kaido except for there's one thing and it, this has always irked me and it's the scope control. Like the yeah. way that, that they handle scopes is like it has to be ex basically like you have to know what the domain is, like the root yeah. domain in some extent. Yeah. Because it like on Burp you can literally just put like word and it'll just regex like. And okay, I, I love literally, that. I literally, t I, there's an open ticket. They're gonna push it in. I think probably okay. the next patch or maybe the patch after that. But I've told them like, dude, ninety percent of the time, I just want to give it a keyword 
And Same. I want to see, you know, S3 buckets that have Facebook yeah. in it. I want to see, you know, uh, tangential domains that have, you know, the word Facebook in it or whatever. Yeah. Like that, that's the way to do it. And and it, it'll get there. It'll get there. And then in the meantime, it's a little bit of a pain. But yeah. Um, yeah. Because I found like, yeah. for example, I was, I've also been trying to use Kaido significantly more as like yeah. my main tool, mainly just because the projects, like, honestly, like I wish it was more, Dude, it's so more nice. than this, but the project switching is just like a huge hassle in burp. Um, and it the is. fact that you can just like make a new project and you can just switch through it in the same window and all that. It's so nice. It's um, like a two minute time. Like, like yeah. I have like a crazy, crazy strong server that I use as my main, you know, computer yeah. here, 128 gigs of Ram top processor I could get at the time. It still takes me like yeah. two minutes to switch into burp projects. Right? Right? Yeah. And well, Kido, and the crazy it's literally thing is that three seconds. I used to do this this like really janky setup where I would run multiple instances of burp because it got so much. This got on my nerves so badly that I would run multiple instances of burp and I would only like I would have the proxy tab open and I would just check uncheck the listener on the other instances that I wasn't using and then yeah. when I switch projects I would like uncheck minimize bring up the other instance turn the proxy on and just like do it like that and just yeah. ignore all the the warnings and whatever when you launch with the temporary files and, and like it's just it's just a pain so i've been switching more to kaido and uh that's like the one thing that really that i miss is that i was i was hacking on a scope for example and mm -hmm. i had their domain in there and usually what i'll do is i'll mm -hmm. do percent dot domain dot com as well as sure. domain dot com because that's yeah, another yeah. thing that like you have to explicitly anyways um and I was like doing a bunch of hunting and sure enough, I see in the DNS logs, like there's some completely separate root domain that like had the keyword in it, but yep. I didn't know it existed. And I was like, oh shit, like maybe I've been, you know, <laughs> who knows, maybe I've been missing stuff on this. So, um, you know, once they, once they get that added, that'll be really awesome. I do like the idea of the, the, like the scope control that they have, but I think for bug bounty hunting often it, it needs to be like just very broad. Or just do a full regex. Yeah, you exactly. Know, like, just make it regex. We can all like, write regex, regex, you know? Default if to you regex, can't write, please. Like, yeah. If you can't yeah. write regex, you, you need to go fix that. You know, like, <laughs> like there's so many bugs that happen because of regex. Hackers, 90% of the time, should be able to write regex. All right. Crazy um, side tangent here. I, oh, geez. When I first started hacking, I yeah. used to write in burp full regex statements with, like, conditional ors and, like, Every subdomain, every everything in one entry in my in my host in my like target config no. in burp. And one time I was at a live hacking event and Chubb saw me doing that and he was like, What are you doing? And I was like <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm adding this to the scope. He was like, dude, just put like what just, just put like we Facebook. I was like We we've always had we've all had that moment with Shubs. Anyone who's met Shubs has been and you know he's kind as can be that. He's like, hey man, I just wanna let he, you know. He like called That's Naffy over. He's stupid, like Naffy, you know, like, like, you know? like He's like, dude, can you this guy's writing full regexes for all his hosts. I was like, oh, I, man. Wait, doesn't everybody do this? No, no, Joel. Yeah. Only, but from that day, sort of thing, I, I realized you know, the easiest way is just keyword. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same sort of thing with when I first learned that you could rename tabs. Oh, oh, by the way, on that note, you know, another thing about Kaido is that I've really been. Okay. Here we We're go. Back into the, Let's just do ba it. Back, I, I'm going on to a tangent. Let's do it, though. It, it, it's that kind of day on the pod. Um so going back to what we were talking about before with notes, I have had the opportunity to um, uh, screen share with some hackers that I really respect recently um, and that take very deep notes. And um, these hackers that I'm talking about, they're not using Burp or Kaido uh, or Zap. They're using Postman. And and it, it's because they're coming from a dev background, right? Okay. But, and, and, and it Postman works for them. It's part of histories, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It, it and they're using like um, they're using uh, what are they using? Uh, it's like Fiddler maybe I think yeah. to get like a, as a proxy, and then they'll recreate it in Postman. And I was like, okay. okay, that's ridiculous. Why would you do that? You know, it takes so much time. But here's the thing, man. The guy that I'm talking and I'm, uh, I'm thinking of has like a whole collection of like essentially built out API docs for his target with sample requests and he knows everything about it. And it's, he's a, he's a master of it, you know, like, and it's all organized, yeah. you know, all the tabs have like get, you know, and then whatever path you're doing, it's very easy to navigate through and get the request you need. Um, and so big, big fan of that. I, I definitely don't think that you need to go as far as to use Postman with it, but I've mentioned yeah. to Kaido like, Hey, it would be really cool 
if we could provide some sort of like um, either even like an LLM prompt or like a uh, some sort of configuration to auto name our tabs and and you know have them put into a certain collection or something like that um, based off of where they are in the application and that sort of thing and just yeah. get a little bit more organized and be able to uh, use the collections a little better and I'm actually getting to the point now where I am using the collections better in Kaido mm -hmm. um, where I'm creating you know certain collections for gadgets for volumes for interesting yeah. requests I need to come back to, for specific chains that I'll need to do, like, oh, I'm going to chain this request and this request and this request together in that order. So then I just create a collection, drop them all in there, boom, 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 that sort of thing. Um, so definitely some value in being a little bit more organized with your collections, which I'm really appreciative that Kaido has in place. Yeah, for sure. So I used to do a very similar thing. Um, I I use I don't use Postman. I, I like Postman, but I use a, a tool called Paw. Or, well, uh, what's it called now? Um, uh, rapid API, paw.cloud, ah, but it, it's okay. it's Mac only. Um, so maybe that's why Postman. But um, <laughs> it's basically the same thing. It, it you know it lets you uh structure you know sort of like it like a developer really. Like you can group mm, your requests, mm. you can set up different HTTP requests. They all have like parameterized inputs. Um, you know it, it's it's made for like testing APIs really. Yeah. Um, as a developer, um, but the the really nice use case that I like to use it for is when I have very complex. HTTP requests that often require some sort of crypto. Good example of this is OAuth uh, HMAC. Um, mm. I believe Twitter uses this. Uh, I think there's a couple other um, things that use it that I'm blanking on. But some sometimes they will use OAuth HMAC in their authentication flow. And it, it requires that you have to generate a signature for every single request. Um, and, and that it has to like have Dude. a token that's like based on your current request and has to be included in the request. And it's like... You can't do it in Burp, like in any easy way whatsoever. You could maybe script it in Python, but these tools often have extensions that are designed exactly for this. So you say, oh, my auth is OAuth. Here's my key. Here's my secret. Done. That's it. Like you just send your request. It automatically signs it. It automatically puts the token in. It automatically does all that kind of stuff. And in addition to that, because it's designed for APIs, you can often structure it. So for example, you can use variables. Uh, I, I assume you can probably do this in, in Postman. I'm not 100% mm -hmm. familiar, but you can in, in Rapid API, where you say, you know, within this project, I have a variable called, let's say, hostname, right? Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. all of your requests, you just reference the variable hostname. And then if you need to change that, or you want to have Dude, that's so nice for a staging IDs. environment that you want to test instead, you just change it in one place, it changes it everywhere. Um, and so there, there's there's some really nice things that you can do with the, the sort of like structured side of that, the, the like developer side of those testing tools that make it really nice to test APIs. Honestly, yeah. the only hassle with it is that you have to kind of like rewrite it, right? So like it's not as easy as just sending it to your repeater tab and just like editing the path and sending it. You have to basically like clone it in. Um, there are importers, I think, in most of these tools. So like you can paste it from like curl or you can paste it from a raw HTTP request and it'll like parse it out. Um, but you know, it's a little bit Dude. of hassle, but again, for those yeah. cases where it's like, you know, signing or HMAC and that kind of stuff, it's really, really good for those. That would be huge in, in Burp or Kaido, having the ability to set a variable and say like, okay, this is going to be my org ID always, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and just be able to reference that in all of the requests and then yeah. have it like it's almost it. Hackverter esque, right? Where, where yeah, like it's kind it of. Is. It's like Hackverter as a whole application where like it's yeah. really designed around like you can have gadgets, you can like in Paw, for example, like you can um, you can wrap variables in different functions and gadgets that like modify that. So you can like hex encode or you can, you know, basic mm -hmm. d4 encode or decode or like you can do all sorts of different modifications on stuff like on the fly. Um, that makes it really, you know, really useful for those things. Things that you could probably do to some extent with Hackverter, uh, but without an extension, there's just no way to do it in Burp. Yeah, and in Kaido, you can do it with convert workflows. Yeah. Uh, if you just select the whole request and then send it to a convert workflow, you yeah. know, shell out and then do it in Python and then replace it back or whatever, uh, you could definitely make that work. Um, uh, so that's interesting. Uh, w once Kaido actually implements the whole keep your workflows across multiple projects thing, I think I'm going to I'm gonna do that because that's the other big pain point right now is that I have to redefine my my convert stuff every uh, for every single project. Um, but once they do that, I think I'll start doing a little bit more tooling surrounding that sort of thing. Um, yeah. That would definitely be that would definitely be huge. And and I would love to see that it also integrated with a built-in sort of request minimizer 
like they have in in, in burp. Uh, it's a burp extension, but uh, so, something that just breaks the request down to the bare bones. You know, that okay, I know I need this me. cookie. Uh, I, I wanted what? to, I wanted to like it so bad, but it never works for me. What? It I, always works for me. What do you mean it doesn't work? Whenever for you? I use it, it always like gives me like it takes a long time, and then it gives me like a weird output uh, that like doesn't that doesn't work, and so I end up just what? doing it myself. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe no I, maybe I'm doing it wrong, but yeah. It definitely takes a long time. I'll give you that. And you, there's no feedback because of how Burp plugins are designed, you know. Yeah. But um, it, I, it always gives me a good result. Okay. And, and uh, yeah, I guess you need to make sure you're giving it the base request, right, um, with the expected output as the re response. Because the first thing it's going to do is it's going to send the request, look at the output, and then it's going to remove everything that still that results in anything different than that output, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so... Yeah, that's uh, that's that's a cool tool. I would love to see that integrated into Kaido as well. Really looking forward to when we get to plugins and plugins I'm able to soon. just sit down and like you know code out all these plugins that I that I need. This is our chance, uh, Justin. We could we could be uh, ahead of the market. It, all they have to do is monetize plugins, and we're we're billionaires. Oh, true, man. True. Yeah. Like, how the heck are we gonna do that? Hackers are gonna be like <laughs> just go into the code and be like, okay, like <laughs> is licensed replace function. Return true, you know, like it's gonna that would be terrible. Um, one um, thing I did want to mention before we get yeah. too lost on this tangent, Charlie from JS Weasel is yeah. in the Discord. And yeah, he's posted a couple really useful like tips, um, feature updates, mm. um, things that people didn't really know. I saw he posted something about being able to combine um, the files that it found. Yeah, and everybody was like, "Wait, what? You could do that? I didn't know there was a thing." Um, super cool. So, uh. Don't go in there and pester him <laughs> about problems. He said, uh, I think he even dropped an email that, um, like, I think it's support at jsweasel.io, yeah. I want to say. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, if you have, like, problems, just, like, send an email because that's the best way for them to track it. But he's posting really awesome stuff in there. He's, he, you know, he's letting people know about really cool things. So it's it's an awesome way to interact um, with, with Charlie from from JS Weasel, if yeah. uh, that's something I, you're interested in. I know, the, I know the Kaido guys as well are in there. Um, and, yeah. and they XML also have their hacker. own Discord, which is super, yeah. like, you know, great place to they're very responsive in there if you file support tickets it's all like you know they make it super easy um so yeah you should check out their discord too the kaido discord yeah 100 percent. yeah they i've been i've been pleased with yeah like i mentioned xnl hackers in there bevix is in there um <clears throat> speaking of bevix um dude awesome tool that will will um, yeah, there was so much, let, so many cool jump. researches, research it, it, things. It's down a little bit in the in the yeah. notes. Um, yeah. I, I don't remember to be, he on it. To be honest, he released it quite a while ago, but I don't think we've talked about it yet because we had a couple episodes queued to get us yeah. through the holidays. But he released this uh, ssrf.cvssadvisor.com thing, and I saw yep. it before. And if I shouted it out, it, you know, it was in passing. I've used this extensively now, and. It rocks. Um, this yeah, is so it's basically a great collaborator. Collab, right? uh, re replacement for collaborator. Yeah. 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 I was going to say um, more and more, dude, I run into the problem where my burp collab is blocked uh, because yeah. I just use the default one. And yep. like, it's such a hassle to set up your own burp collab server. Like, unless you do it in the cloud where there's no IP restrictions. And, and like, even then, like, you often want a domain. So, like, it's a whole thing. And like, mm. Why? Like, <laughs> why is this so hard? Like, <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a real pain. Hundred percent, and this solves a lot of it. And I, I kind of talked about this before. Um, actually, I think I sent out a tweet about it, which is like, for any people building Burp plugins right now, like, stop <laughs> and, and and make it make it something a little bit more generic. Make it make it something that can be used. Uh, you know, in Kaido, something that could be used in Burp, something that could be used in Postman or whatever, yeah. right? Um, I really like the the trend of having this, you know, go in a different direction. That's why I really appreciate what what Bebex did there. Um, and it's got more features, and it's a you can define your response and that sort of thing, which is really cool. One of the things that just came to mind because of what you just said is, I wonder if he would be open to coding it in such a way that you can define your own domain and then just point it at it pointed yeah. at the ip address right and, yeah, i just and, don't know how it does the like the routing maybe it's all vhost or something um, yeah but, but it seems yeah, pretty doable gonna, right say, this kind of reminds me of like way back when bug bounty first started popping off in like 2017 2018 there was a big influx of tool development where like durbuster go go search uh, yeah. uh derb um 
yeah fuff like uh, you know yeah all these like crazy crazy tools just like popped out of the woodworks like f- got created out of necessity and then things kind of died down a lot of stuff got consolidated into like the proxy tools or whatever but now we're seeing like we're kind of returning back to fundamentals and it's nice to see that like the community is sort of like surging back and being like hey you know like you could probably do this with burp collaborator but if you want to do it not with burp collaborator because of need need i go back into all the problems that people sure. have with burp collaborator you know you can do this and i it reminds me like back in the day there was a lot of tools that were like this ping bin uh hdp bin mm-hmm. yeah. um there was a couple DNS other bin. ones yeah dns bin like <laughs> there were always like separate tools for like the different protocols and stuff that were all just like online tools you just like open it up it would give you a random url and you could just use it as your payload it's pretty functional you know yeah but a lot of them are like dead now unfortunately so it's nice yeah. that like we're kind of reviving it to some extent i don't know if this if this srf testing uh tool is only for HTTP and https um yeah but, it is uh, um and i'm okay. not even sure i'm not even sure it's for HTTP, i haven't yeah. used it for http yet so i'm not even sure that huh. it supports http but i'm 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 really excited about the fact that i, I need to hit pevix up after this pod and, and tell him hey man it would be great if you could just like provide we could provide our own domain pointing at that ip address and have your own version without any setup necessary right that should be totally yeah. doable and then the other thing is like i would love um the, the one thing that this does or does or doesn't do that collaborator does do <laughs> couldn't get that out um is that DNS. uh it, it doesn't do dns yeah. right and dns is huge um and it's a pain in the butt to you know get it set up sometimes you know yeah. i've talked before about how easy it is to get it set up with dns chef but it's not as simple as http for sure um but i would love to see that also sort of integrated into this uh i could definitely see the community really start, starting to get behind this project as a as a primary um replacement to collaborator if we could define our own domains and then also get dns callbacks that'd be huge yeah 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 i mean this is basically like all those tools that I was talking about earlier, like all those HTTP based p- ping bin, DNS bin, HTTP bin, mm-hmm. whatever bin, all in, you know, but well, this is really just HTTP right now, but hopefully we can, you know, get to that, all those other protocols and everything too. Um, and then maybe provide it in a way that uh, other people can can mess with it too. Yeah, 100%. Dude, um, we are not even, we, <laughs> we're not even halfway done with the pre-episode. Oh, so uh, we're not going to get to the full, full episode today. All right. um, do you have time? I have a little bit of time. Okay. All right. All right. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep going down talking about this cool stuff though. One thing that I wanted to share that we mentioned on the, on the discord and I realized wasn't really sort of common knowledge for people is this sort of concept of an iframe sandwich. Uh, and it's not really an iframe sandwich, but it's sort of like an, an open iframe sandwich okay and and so uh this is something that you can do because i've mentioned before on the pod and in other mediums that if you have a target that iframes in a subdomain okay so let's say one of the one of the the first time i actually fully exploited this the scenario was uh my target domain iframed in a marketing subdomain where you could control your email preferences or whatever right okay not a huge impact in that scenario but i did something cool with it with oauth stuff and got atl um no big deal the yeah <laughs> but um uh in that scenario, the iframe domain, which is different from the, uh, a different domain from the primary domain, if you can pop an XSS on that iframed domain, you can do some cool shit, okay? So what you can do is from an attacker, and keep in mind, this domain is is iframed, so normally it has, um, you know, iframe allow configurations. So what you can do from your attacker controlled page, you can iframe in, uh, do an invisible iframe to that subdomain where you have the XSS, pop the XSS, get JS control, okay? Then from the attacker controlled page, pop open a new tab to the the victim domain that you would like to attack. And that victim domain has the XSS vulnerable subdomain iframed in, right? And then what you can do is you can reach from the iframe on the attacker controlled page up to the attacker page, over to the, the victim domain, and then down into the XSS domain um, on that page by using different frames. And because you control um, JS on the iframe on your page, you can modify the content of the iframe on the victim domains page, right? I, that's iframed into the victim domains page. And you can affect that content. So let's say in that scenario, you can rewrite the content with like, you know, 
uh, something that might could leak tokens, something that could, you know, you could put even a, uh, you know, sort of a phishing thing in there. And that sort of thing is, is normally accepted in my experience because you're affecting the integrity of the in-scope ap application by modifying the contents of a domain that they are iframing into their website. Um, and, and so I kind of call this an iframe sandwich. It's not really, you know, when iframes used to be a little bit more permissive, you could do some cooler stuff with that. But um, just making sure you understand how frames work and, and how, what kind of stuff you can access using parent, using opener, using so the frames sure array. This. Yeah, yeah. On, let's say, victim.com. You have one tab yeah. open, victim.com. Right. Inside it, they have vulnerable.com. Yes. Or, no, vulnerable no, no. Yeah, vulnerable.com or, you know, vulnerable.victim.com or something like that. Okay, sure. And vulnerable.victim.com is vulnerable to an XSS. Yes. So now you get an XSS, you have an XSS inside an iframe on, uh, on victim.com. The, well, not exactly. Okay, so let, let, me, let me break it down a little bit, a, a little bit better. You've got, your, you've got two frames or two pages, two tabs with iframes in them, okay? Okay. One is an attacker control or an attacker page, and one of them is the victim page. Both of them have an iframe to um, access his vulnerable domain, right? Okay. Using the X, uh, you can't control the the path in that is iframed into the victim's domain. Yep. So that's always going to be iframed to wherever the victim says it's, it should go, right? Okay. But on the attacker controlled page, you you can control it. So you pop XSS through that, reach back up through the attacker controlled page reach over to the, the tab that's opened up uh, the other iframed page, reach into the iframe and modify the content. Does that make uh, sense? Okay, yeah, so it's, it's almost backwards instead. Like you're modifying the, the victim page from the attacker page. Exactly. Like, because it's the same iframe in both because of them. It's because the it's the same origin. Yeah, right, same origin. So you can co communicate with iframes of the same origin in a different tab. <laughs> Is there a better way to explain this? Because I, I had the it was same a, trouble. Well, you explained it from the it. other way around. It was a little confusing because it was kind of like you get an XSS within this iframe and then you set up your own page. Like, I, th I think the way you just described it now is better where basically you have two pages. They both iframe the same URL. You have an XSS in both of them, but you can easily pop it from your attacker page, which then you can use that context to communicate with the context. They both the iframe, iframe in, in the other you, page. You iframe. They both iframe the same domain, but probably a different URL if it's a reflected XSS. Yeah, whatever, like right? you know, like yeah. there's no saying that like maybe on victim.com, right? Like that you'd be able to actually pop it through the URL or something. Maybe it's an right. attack, a, a complex attack scenario. It doesn't really matter yeah. because all you need is control over that iframe context with the same origin, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, cool, exactly. Cool. And as long as you control, you're running JS execution, right, on that on that origin, and you have a path to reach the the other frame, right? In this scenario, it would be parent. Oh, that's why you open it up tab, from the iframe. Is that why you Does open that... it from victim.com? Why you have to open it from victim.com? No, no, no. Well, you you have you have attacker controlled page with the with the yeah. XSS embedded. Oh, would you into just it. open the victim page from your attacker page? Exactly. Got it. That one. Understood. Yeah, and then you hop over there and modify it. Um, man, maybe I should uh, maybe <laughs> let me let me make a note here. What what? Uh, I'll, we need a, we need a cardboard a, box diagram from. I'll <laughs> I'll uh, I'll draw a little draw a diagram or iframe sandwich. Um, I'll draw a little diagram and put it on the screen yeah. <laughs> for those of you watching I think I on it. YouTube. So basically, you, you yeah. open attacker.com. Attacker.com yep. opens a new tab with victim.com. They both yep. iframe the same URL. You pop the yep. XSS from your attacker.com in the, in the iframe, which can then yep. communicate with the iframe in the other tab on victim.com. And then you can either control the content, you can do whatever you want within that iframe. Exactly. Yeah, and, it, it. and, and you know, um, depending on the refer policy and stuff like that, you might be able to, to leak, uh, you know, you, uh, OAuth parameters and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, so all sorts of cool stuff you can do with that. It's a good way to take an XSS in a subdomain that's, you know, maybe not even in scope or less important and make it affect the primary domain and increase your impact. Mm. Um, mm. So these Very are the cool. kind of things we're discussing in in the uh, in the CTBB podcast Discord. Um, so check it out, ctbb.show slash Discord. Hop on in and join that conversation. Um, all right. <laughs> so now we're done with the pre-show, and now we're in, <laughs> and uh, and now we can go into the news section. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and let's pop open these links, and and we'll start. We, we already covered uh, Bevix 
his little his thing on um, uh, the SSRF yeah. tool. So that's good. We got some work done. Um, first thing on the list, Johan Carlson um, sort of retweeted a uh, a tweet that you guys really liked from the Critical Thinking account, talking about a good open redirect. Um, sort of bypass to get to get open redirect and he added a really um, insightful piece of information let me let me read that for you there are some good and common ways to gain redirects like at and dot but I have also had a lot of success with double slash so slash slash a lot of simple filters check if the URL is relative by checking if it starts with a slash forgetting that slash slash attacker.com is not a relative domain uh, but is actually a uh, an absolute URL. Um, and then he posts some examples down in the bottom uh, of sort of deviations on this attack that have, that use backslashes, that use white space, that sort of thing. Um, and just really good to be aware of these because sometimes if you can bypass, you know, people make fun of open redirect as a vulnerability, but sometimes if you can bypass redirect logic, it's a real problem. So I mean, knowing like these tricks is really helpful. SSRF 101 is like, yeah, yeah, like check if it's in the same domain. Okay, well, if you have an open redirect and a lot of times it follows redirects, then game over. Yeah, and, and, and not even just SSRF, but also it's OAuth 101 OAuth, yeah. is like, you know, if you can affect that Maybe redirect to your eye. Yeah, in some scenarios, SAML as well. Um, if you can affect that redirect to your eye, then you're golden. Um, so definitely... Definitely something to keep in mind. Appreciate Johan uh, hopping in there, um, joining the conversation, and adding something uh, really relevant there that I've used a ton of times and just forgot to include in yeah. that tweet. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, the double slash thing is a classic. I mean, you see this a lot in browsers legitimately too. Like script mm -hmm. URLs often use double yeah. slash because um, I think double slash is used to default to the same protocol that the page uses, right? Exactly. Right. Yep. Yeah. So if it's using HTTP, it'll use HTTP. If it's using HTTPS, it'll use HTTPS. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 So really good. Uh, really good tip there. Yeah. Nice um, one. There was a um, there was another tweet. Well, actually, mm. yeah, it was a tweet. Um, but also it was posted somewhere within our hacker circles. Um, yeah. But the Google um, bug bounty program, VRP program, vulnerability rewards mm. program, whatever you want to call it. Yep. That's um, it. they released a burp suite plugin written in part by one of our buddies, Irby Sam. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's it's specifically for protobuf testing. Uh. I think it's meant for Google, but you could probably use it for other things. It's a little mm. bit narrow in terms of how it works if you look into it, because I installed it and I was like, why isn't this working? Um, it, it looks for um, application slash proto, I think, in, in the like mm. in the response header, but then it will basically decode it and it will um, it'll make it easy so that you can manipulate uh, the protobuf requests without having to have the proto the proto files. Um, mm. And yeah, it's uh, it's really awesome. Um, I think there's like been a lot of different tools that like kind of sort of do similar stuff to this kind of um but uh, not not very well or not completely and um yeah this is really nice to see i have a solo episode about protobuf stuff that i still need to record um mm -hmm. and, yeah looking uh, forward to i'll probably one, include this in there as well but yeah there's a there's a lot of really interesting stuff that you can do with protobuf and that you can use to figure out how protobuf is working yeah, I was, I was, <laughs> once again, you know, the moat is disappearing here. You know, I, I was uh, excited, but also a little sad to see them release this because um, Lupin and I, mostly Lupin, really, uh, coded up an extension to do this exact same thing, probably with less good results because Google actually has a bunch of resources <laughs> to allocate to it. Like three engineers were working on it, including Sam, uh, rather than just what Lupin did late at night one night. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, we used this when we were hacking Bard, and we found a bunch of great phones with it. Um, and and so definitely increases the accessibility of the Google VRP because one of the biggest problems with hacking on Google is you got to be a protobuf G, you know, to figure all that out. Um, so really great. And I, um, furthermore, I think this is a great example of how to be a good program. You know. Um, if you build tools specifically to help hackers hack your program, this takes a lot of work because you have to be aware of how hackers see your program, right? You have to be aware of the problems they're running into. You pretty much have to have tried to hack yourself, right? Which is yeah. something that so many companies aren't even actually doing. Um, and then you have to take the initiative to get some engineering done 
build out an extension and then give it to the community. Uh, I, I, I'm 100% sure that Google will see a ton of ROI on their time for building out this tool because it makes it so much more approachable. And I would love to see companies that have insight into their own architecture do similar things to help promote their program. Yeah, absolutely. Um, at it's at really Joel cool. Margolis with the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, with yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. So no, I'd say like, um, I think another good example of this is like SSRF sheriffs, for yeah. example. Like stuff, exactly. like stuff like that that just show, makes it easier to hack on your program. Especially, you know, Google has like, for the, for a very long time, it felt like Google had created a very complicated stack that was hard to hack on, and mm. they didn't really care about yeah. that. And it Which was is not just bad for their overall security, but you know, right? But it's really security through obscurity, and it basically yeah. just raised the bar for hacking. It didn't make it more secure, right? And so, mm-hmm. I think by doing this, this helps bring the bar back down a little bit, so that it's easier to start hacking on Google stuff, and they can still get the security benefit of having people look at their program and being able to hack on it without like doing you know, like if you imagine like a new person comes and like starts to hack on some Google product that uses protobuf they're going to see this and be like I have no idea what this is I it's literally exactly it's what just I did binary data I don't know what a protobuf is they go and look up protobuf is some weird format they don't understand the use case they don't understand why it is or how it is or any and they just give up they move on they go to a different program they find something that doesn't use it um and so you need you need to do stuff like this if you're going to be using it so extensively and have such a a a large program if you want people to be able to hack on your program you got to do stuff like this Um, yeah 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 no i i I totally agree creating those those means to do that very very important um Let's let's see. Okay, so I guess I'll go ahead and pivot from here into some JS hoisting stuff. You good with that? Sure, go for it. I, I feel like I had something else on that last topic that I wanted to say, but it escaped me. So and maybe it'll come back later, and 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 I'll I'll kind of go from there. But okay. um, so I tweeted out something. <laughs> it's funny to see my own name in the doc here, <laughs> you know, under <laughs> under the news section. But I tweeted something out, which I thought was worthy to talk about on the podcast um, because it's a pretty cool exploitation scenario. And we've been having some chats like this a good bit on Twitter, um, uh, just sort of surrounding various XSS scenarios we run into. And a lot of them have been brought to me by the community, the critical thinking community, just DMing me and being like, hey, um, I have a bug here, but I can't fully exploit it, you know? Um, And sometimes I'll take a look, sometimes I won't. No promises, no promises. But um, this time I did decide to take a look. And the scenario was this. Um, We had an injection. uh, So I'm I'm going down a path of trying to represent things from an audio perspective. It's going to be tricky. But let's say we had an injection at a place in the JS where it was x dot y, where neither x nor y were defined. Okay. Can you control Um, them? No, you can't control oh, them. They're okay. they're not defined, and then it's 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 a function call. So it's calling the function x dot y. The first parameter is a one. There's a comma, and then you are injecting. Okay, and you can inject anything you want except for script tags. You have to stay inside the script, right? Um, how do you get this to resolve? Because as soon as it reads the line, it's going to say x is undefined, uh, you know, or, or y is undefined. Can't access read a property on undefined error, and then your code is never going to run. Um, And so I was looking at this. I was like, I know that there's a way to exploit this. I can't figure out what it was. And I tried, actually, the solution that ended up working, but I was missing one stupid little piece. Um, And the answer to this problem is something called JS hoisting. Have you heard of JS hoisting, Joel? Mm, I don't know if I've heard of the term, but if you explain it to me, I I might have heard of it. Yeah. So the term is JS hoisting, and it's essentially the concept that functions in JS defined using, and some other um, objects as well, but mostly for this case functions, defined using the function keyword, despite where they are in the flow, will be hoisted to the top of the the script execution flow. So if you define a function at the very bottom using the function keyword of a script tag, and you call that function above where that function is defined, it'll work because the function mm-hmm. definition is getting moved up to the top of um, the, the script, okay? Mm-hmm. So in this scenario, what we were able to do was define the function x, okay? And, 
And what that would do is it would hoist the definition up to the top. So now the variable x now contains a valid function. Okay. So when you try to access the property y on x, you don't get an error, but you get y is undefined. Then it will attempt to call the, the undefined uh, y because of the function call. And when it does that, it will parse the parameters that are being passed into that function. And at that point, when it parses the parameters, you can do a function call in the parameters themselves. Um, and that will get executed before it attempts to call y, which will inevitably fail because you can't call undefined. Um, and in that way, we were able to get arbitrary script execution and pop it into an XSS because of this concept called JS wasting. So I wanted to shout that out there because we're big fans of, of uh, that kind of crazy edge fringe JavaScript shit here on the pod. Um, and I'm not, I wasn't even sure. Yeah, I, I, I feel like most people haven't heard of it. So I, I would have been surprised if you had heard of that, Joel. Yeah, I was, I was just testing some things around. <laughs> he's, got a, he's got a handheld mic and he's trying to <laughs> type and speak into the. <laughs> yeah. I was testing some things around this uh, to see if there's a better way. And I think there might be without having to break out of the whole thing. <laughs> All right, this is like classic uh, Joel nerd sniped shit right here. Okay, all right, Joel, rein it in, rein it in. Bring okay, it back okay. to the pod. Okay, what I was gonna he say says, is He says, okay, though, he's still freaking looking at it. I am still freaking looking at it. I was just gonna, <laughs> it's not fun. Okay, um, yeah, so the JS hoisting thing, it seems that, so context is important, right? Um, yeah. Basically, my thought was like, maybe you could do this without having to break out of the function. Um, but even if you define X within the parameters, it doesn't work because it's right. within the, con like, so it, you can it do It never the, gets evaluated because it fails bef right in the beginning. Right. So like you, you, uh, tweeted out, uh, a similar, like an XSS challenge, like a while ago and mm -hmm. had to do with essentially in JavaScript, there's a behavior where you can use commas to provide multiple statements and it, and you can assign variables to the last variable, the last mm -hmm. thing that is returned in that comma sequence. Um, yeah. And you can abuse that in a similar way here, um, where you can use that for like, you know, one comma, whatever, and you can just, it, it, within your parameters, you can do the same thing. Um, but because it's within that context of it's already trying to call it, it seems that it has to be like what you said, like you have to define it because it's going to try and call it before it evaluates. Um, well, it, it's going to try to read the the... Yeah, like the object the, itself. So it's, it's going to say, does the object to... exist? Then it gets mm. the parameters. Then it passes them into the function call. Exactly. And when it tries to say, hey, I need to get the X or the Y property of X, then yeah, X doesn't and, exist and X yet. is undefined, then you can't get a property of undefined. And then right. that'll error. Right. Um, so shout out to BitK um, and to Johan and a couple of the other people that I think Carl also, Carell Origin, um, also got it. Um, and was able to to exploit this. So uh, definitely appreciate the the help there. And I learned a lot about JavaScript that day because then I had to deep. Of course, I had to deep dive JS hoisting. So there's a bunch of um, you can do it with variables. You can do it with classes. But the cool thing about functions is it's not just um, the thing doesn't just get defined. It gets sort of a, it, it's initialized yeah. too. It's an actual well, object. And like, I'm pretty sure the reasoning for this was that like way back in the day. There was a there was a historical problem with programming languages where if you define something after it was used, it couldn't be called. Mm -hmm. And I think this was most common with like C and C plus plus and stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you had a function that was like, if your main function essentially wasn't at the end of your program, then you couldn't like mm -hmm. call anything else because it didn't know it existed. I think this was maybe why header files. Exi I don't know. I'm, I'm sure. not an expert on this, but essentially, like that's part of what JS is trying to solve here is that like if you call something before it's defined, it should still be able to call it even if, because it's defined, it's just that like it, it does some restructuring and like, I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah. It's, it's super interesting. Um, well, the, like the other reworking interesting that existing thing, behavior to, to work in your, in your, in your favor. Yeah. The, the other interesting thing with this is that, um, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work for variables to find the function. So for example, if you did var x equals function, blah, 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 and defined it that way, like you were defining a variable pointing to a function rather than using the function keyword, then it won't work. But if you use the function keyword um, as the primary expression in that, that line of code, then um, it, will, it will hoist it. 
So lots of cool, lots of cool things there. I was just talking to my my brother in law the other day, who's a programmer, and we were talking. He was saying he freaking hates JavaScript, and I was like, man, I love JavaScript because JavaScript. There's so many ways to get everything done, and there's so many quirks to the language. It's like a hacker's dream. It really is. So. It really is. Yeah, it's super interesting that um, if you define it as a variable, it works but doesn't work. What do you mean? So when you when you do like if you do var x equals function afterwards, after the call, yeah. it'll say, cannot read properties of, oh, no, it doesn't work. Sorry, I misread it. I yeah. misread it. My bad. Sorry. Well, sometimes it'll, so there is something you can do with var, because var will hoist the the definition to the top, or the um, initialization. No, nope, not that. The definition to the top, but not the initialization. There we go. Um, or maybe it's the declaration. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. It'll, it'll hoist the declaration, but it will not hoist the initialization. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a little bit of a of a quirky thing there. This All right, so Joel. Um, so before we get further nerd sniped on this, let's move to the <laughs> next thing. Because actually, as far as nerd sniping goes, I was just kind of researching this 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 morning on a whim, and I am just. I just love CSP bypass shit, dude. I don't know why. It just feels great. Um, and this is so cool. Once again, our boy Johan is just dropping all sorts of amazing shit. This one was actually in the um, the cool research uh, channel on the on the Discord, which is a gold mine of cool research. I'm so glad we built that channel. Yeah, um, for real. I've been reading everything that comes through there, and I've seen so many things that I've missed somehow. Um, so really appreciate everyone contributing to that. One of the things that was dropped in there was this crazy, uh, yeah, it's the first one, uh, Joel, octagon.net, this crazy write-up um, on how to do some CSP bypassing using JSONP, okay? And of course, everyone says, okay, using JSONP, that's like the classic way to get past CSP. Uh-uh, this is different, okay? This is real different. Um, and what's happening here is um, in the specific example, it's using WordPress, a WordPress endpoint that has JSONP compatibility, right? So you can bypass CSP on, on a WordPress site. Yep. This one is so cool. What, what, but the, the, the JSONP endpoint that's there, it doesn't allow you to use commas, it doesn't allow you to use things, so it's a secure JSONP endpoint. It doesn't allow you to write your own code, essentially, in the callback, right? Mm -hmm. It just allows you to use dots and letters, which is what you see with a lot of fixed JSONP endpoints. They don't want you to be able to write alert, you know, open bracket, close bracket, and then just be able to run arbitrary code there. But he, this guy figured out a way to actually use this still to bypass CSP, okay? So essentially what, what he figured out how to do was, um, so in a JSONP endpoint, it obviously it, it's gonna call the function with its own contents at, at the end of the day. Uh, here, right. Joel, let me, um, let me actually send you, um, I can send you uh, the actual endpoint really quickly here. So you have an example of what I'm looking at. Um, hold on just a sec. I want, I want you to be able to see this because it's just so. Yeah, okay, so here's an example of the actual. I'm going to send it to you on. on uh, I'm going to put it in the, the Riverside chat because it's. Okay. it's uh, I've got Discord closed, so it doesn't. I was going to say, I also did. Yeah. I reopened it there. Um, do you see that? I do see that. Okay, so go to that go to that yep. URL. So you see how it says uh, attacker input, and yep. then it's got the function call and then the data yep. inside of it, right? This is classic yep. JSONP um, uh, callback, call back, yep. okay? Um, what he does here is instead he, so we can only inject characters and, and dots. He builds out this flow, okay? Let me see if I can find it. It says, um, so you can open, wind, you can do window.opener dot whatever, and then select a uh, button on the parent tab, right, via that, and then call the click function with that. And it doesn't matter the context, right? And then what you're going to have to do, you're going to have to open this page up uh, via a, a window.open from your attacker-controlled page, right? Now it's open, it's two separate frames. Redirect the attacker-controlled page to a, a, the target domain where you have a button that you want to get clicked, right? Like delete account, okay? So now the two pages, the two tabs that are open are same origin, right? Okay. And then what you do is you trigger the XSS and it will go back to window.opener when it, when it calls the, the, the XSS 
This is the this is same origin now, so it can reach back up through window.opener and call the dot .click function on a specific button that you want, like delete account, right? So you okay. can actually weaponize this to reach back up to, to the different tab and trigger it with just the use of you know window.opener dot body dot first element sibling mm -hmm. you know define that whole flow out so this is that same kind of where from attacker page you open the victim page and then you're going cross tab using the same origin to abuse behavior within the page similar concept to what we were talking about earlier but a little bit different because after you open the tab with the attacker con um, you know from the attacker controlled page you remove the attacker controlled context from you, you 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 know piece out of there. You redirect that that opener to, or you redirect yourself right. to and just by the, the way page. it behaves. It yeah yeah yeah. And then window dot opener still points back to that frame, which is so cool. I guess that right? makes sense. Yeah, because it's the same. It's like the same tab instance or whatever. Yeah, they're in the same sort of tab group, and window dot opener yeah. is pointing back to that frame. But now that frame is same origin, and so you're mm. not going to get an error if you try to execute window dot opener dot content document dot you know body dot so child dot child dot child dot click right and then it'll just call that function with the csp bypass click on the button and cause so essentially a csurf to happen yeah. um oh, is so that not absolutely breathtaking it's a really interesting exploit i i i love that kind of creativity where you know we've talked about this before but browsers are adding a lot of security features that make it very difficult to exploit um mm even like if something's vulnerable it's difficult to exploit it um mm. like you can see the vulnerability but it's just difficult like just due to security mechanisms in place and these new types of attacks that are coming out now a lot of them are utilizing even within that secure environment they're utilizing just like baseline behavior in order to abuse it in order to make it do stuff that you want like click buttons um like it's almost like a whole new <laughs> csrf <laughs> in a sense yeah, I mean, the same thing that's happening that I rant about all the time with client-side path traversals. Um, yeah, stuff moves over to single-page applications. And, yeah, yeah these, these new sort of um, frontier of vulnerabilities are coming forth, and it's really exciting. Um, it's very hard for me, to be honest. I'm surprised you got it, Joel. Um, it's very hard for me to do this vulnerability um, justice uh, over the audio, audio medium because you really need to be able to kind of see what is happening. Um, so I'm definitely going to link this one. If you're going to read anything that we did today, well, if you're going to, if you're going to do anything that we have talked about today, join the CTBB podcast discord because this stuff pops up there. But if you're going to do two things, the second thing should be, uh, octagon.net, um, write up on bypassing CSP using WordPress by abusing same origin method execution. It's the title of the, the research. Super rad about how they do this sort of frame origin manipulation and then are able to weaponize just call the calling of a function to actually trigger that functionality within the within the confines of csp super inspiring um, super cool yeah really love that uh and and it's it, it, those json p gadgets are actually everywhere you know a, a yeah. json p gadget that allows you to actually are run arbitrary code um, those are those are still there, but they're disappearing. These are everywhere, um, and so really cool to see someone actually be able to exploit that. Yeah, totally. I mean, the CSP bypass tool is always like you know, oh JSON P, and there was yeah. just this discussion about this too, where people were like, I, yeah. don't, I don't really see J JSON P used very much, and you were like, actually, I, I see it all the time. It's I just used everywhere. It recently. Yeah. yeah, so much legacy stuff in there, and and especially if people like will star their own domain in. If they have a, uh, you know, a blog, every company has a blog on their main domain, right? Yep. That uses WordPress. There's WordPress endpoints that use JSONP, just like this. And you can't run arbitrary code, but using this, you can actually get a CSERF with your, you know, sort of half XSS. And this will also help prove that there's impact to XSSs that are blocked by CSP in a lot of cases as well. Um, it just takes time and dedication to actually break through it. So. Um, yeah. On on the uh, on that note, um, another one of my favorite pieces of research uh, released in 2018 by Wallarm, uh, Wall Wallarm, W A L L A R M. Yeah. Um, when I first saw this, I was like, "Wow, this is so genius!" And I figured it'd be fitting here because we're already talking about CSP. 
Um, this is a scenario where you have XSS and you're able to execute you know, your alert because unsafe inline is allowed uh, on the CSP policy. Um, but you can't run arbitrary code, either because of a link limitation or um, because you, the CSP prevents you from reaching out to another domain in any way. And you can't really exfil anything besides maybe like a, a page redirection or something like that, which might mess up your, your flow of, of the attack. This is a really cool bypass that uses sort of uh, proxying of sorts to bypass CSP. And so uh, the scenario is you've got a content uh, security policy with unsafe inline allowed, and, and you want to exfil data. Um, and what you do is you write a script which will iframe in another page on that same domain. So once again, we're same origin. We're abusing origin-related stuff here. You can reach into that iframe, control the content. Um, and you look for a page, like a CSS file, or a JS file, or a PNG file, any sort of file that does not have the content security policy header. And every time I've looked for that, I've found it. Because people use these you know, reverse proxies nowadays where they're like reaching into you know, uh, an S3 bucket to store their assets and that sort of thing. Everyone's doing this. And the CSP header is really not globally defined across the whole scope. Um, and when it's not, you can use that non-CSP header having page as a proxy for communication out. So you iframe in that page, and then you can control the uh, script execution on that iframe in page, and that page does not have CSP limitations. And so then you can use that to arbitrarily grab content that you want to load from uh, you know, your, your, your website, pull it down, and then execute it on the parent context as well, because once again, same origins, we can mm. you know, load a script so on that the, page. So in this scenario, you're basically, mm. you're using, let's say, reflected XSS in line. Yeah. On, on the victim domain to yeah. iframe a same origin domain on the victim that is missing CSP for yeah. something. And then yep. you use your XSS to change the contents of that frame to load. To include a script from right. a different location, right? right? And because and it has no CSP in the frame, then you can include an attacker script which has free access to do whatever it wants. And exactly. you can talk to the parent frame because it's the same origin. Yeah, and that can exfil data. It can load arbitrary scripts, that sort of thing. You know, a lot of times when you're trying to um, show impact for an XSS, they say, hey, please prove arbitrary um, uh, execution of JS, right? Not just alert. Show me mm -hmm. that you can run any script, right? Mm -hmm. um, How do you usually show that? Um, so for me, you know, a lot of times if you can pull from a domain, that's great. But a lot of times when they're asking for this, it's in a length limited context. Right, where you okay. would have a hard time fetching data and exfilling it, right? Um, but uh, in in a scenario like this, um, you if can you sort have of break limited, out because you can include your yeah exactly. And then as soon as you include that script inside the child uh, tag uh, or the child iframe, then you're loading from a domain, and then you've got all the all the JS execution you need to do a multi-step attack. Um, mm -hmm and really exfil some important data. And, and you can also do it blindly, right? You don't need, uh, the victim doesn't need to know that that's happening. Um, yeah. uh, and, and so really cool way to bypass CSP from Wallarm. Um, we'll link that, that uh, technique down in the, in the show notes. Um, do you find, very helpful find that a lot of this iframe stuff is harder to do with, with the X-frame option stuff nowadays? It most certainly is, yeah. But the cool thing about this, though, is that if it's missing the CSP header, it's probably also missing the X frame options mm -hmm. header, because <laughs> uh, okay. those are normally grouped in the same sort of um, reverse proxy header yeah. appending rule. Um, so I, I still see this from time to time. And actually, a technique like this, not exactly like this, but um, but similar to this, helped me score a 70k XSS one time, um, and it was. A heck of a a bug. Um, it's quite an XSS. <laughs> it, it was. It, dude, it's crazy to me that my highest bounty is an XSS, but so uh, it was affecting. I mean, it was it was a company where the client side is everything, you know. Yeah. Um, and the, where they really have to keep their client side tight, and if they if they make a problem, it affects a ton of people. Um, yeah. So, really, really. Excited to make sure people know about this technique as well because it's it's near and dear to my heart. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. All right, we are. What we're like an hour and a half in. Yeah, an we're, hour and we're a half pushing in. it, man. We just made it through the news, so we'll probably what. call it here. 
yeah, we should call it here. I, I'm just going to say this for those of you, um, and, and we'll, we'll cover a little bit more in the future as well on this, but um, OpenID and OAuth stuff, extremely interesting. Impact is everywhere. There's a lot of standardized endpoints from the uh, OpenID standard uh, that will allow you to do a lot better recon on your targets and try to get access to areas of the applications that you may not have access to because of permissioning problems um, by knowing OpenID really well. So um, hopefully we'll deliver you some content in the future, diving into that a little bit deeper. But for now, just know that that is coming because we'll we'll you know do some reading on it beforehand. I, I see what some, your some cursor's on. I see what your cursor's on, and you you just left them with quite a teaser. <laughs> I, I, I did, man. I did. There's some there's some great stuff there. And, you know, I, I, I will say, <clears throat> I'll be the first to say that doing a podcast on an extremely technical st field is extremely challenging. And I think I'm probably subpar at taking extremely technical content and condensing it into just words and conveying that picture to the listener in a way that they, is easily comprehensible. That's something that I'm working on. But um, if you guys actually do the homework after the episodes and maybe even before the episodes when I give you a heads up like this, the stuff that I'm talking about will start making a lot more sense. Um, yeah. And you'll like get a lot more value really out of the podcast. If something's not, really not, not clear, what I'd recommend is go to the show notes, open the link that we're talking about, and side like either side by side or in, in your, your in your headphones mm. listen to us talk about it as you're reading through the article and it'll probably make significantly more sense because that's a lot of what we do as well as we have them both open as we talk about it so um yeah you know, and i think we're, we're talking about well. concepts that might might not be clear um that it, like yeah. verbally we're not great at explaining it but then if you just read through it you'll it'll make sense yeah 100 percent. and i think joel as well you, you do a good job of sort of teasing it out and and making me re-explain it and re-simplifying the words once well, i also I've part kinda... of it is because like you'll, you'll you you tend the way you approach things often is like mm. from the hacker's perspective and this, yeah. is, this is a common mistake as well like report writing this happens all the time where hackers yep. like explain stuff from a hacker's perspective instead of from like a fresh perspective yeah and uh you have like a lot of like side data in there that like makes sense to you but doesn't make sense to anybody else so you have to like yeah it, it, it's difficult it's a skill for sure well i'm glad i brought a program manager on as well to <laughs> to help me get this uh you know sort of context included i'm solid life choices getting you yeah, on this yeah. pod joel i love you man awesome all right, all right. Cool. well that, that's a wrap yeah yeah that's the wrap all right that's the pod peace